This is an artificial constraint being created by Microsoft. Often they wanted to compensate you with stock as well, and most of that's just turned into toilet paper. I have played mini golf with Steve Ballmer. Yeah, well, there's, a, there's lots of shoulda, woulda, coulda. Arguably, they should have rewritten them in C++, but they don't hate themselves that much. Once in a while, it became good things, but not that often. Do you predict that Windows on ARM is going to go from a stillborn child directly to a teenager? Well, it has to because Apple has been quite cavalier about simply killing the... I, I want to be careful here to, to try and uh, uh, censor this as much as I can. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Cloud Architects Podcast. I'm Chris Goosen, and once again, I am joined by Mr. Nicholas Blank. Good morning to you, Chris, and my part of the world to your part of the world. Hey, I, I love these afternoon recordings for me. It's so much better than, than being up at 1 a.m., so I'm always appreciative. Yeah. Uh, and also joined by Warren DeToy. Can you believe it, guys? Two in a row, hey? That's two in a row. Man. And you two in a row. You've had coffee this morning? Hitting... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And I tell you what, I'm 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 very very excited by uh, by our guest today. Um, I've been looking forward to this episode since we kind of got it on the books, and you know I'm a, I've been a follower of this person for a long long time. So you know, honoured actually to to have yeah. Mr. Richard Campbell uh, join us today. Yeah. Richard, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much for having me. This is a real world spanner, huh? So, west coast of Canada, Netherlands, uh, South Africa. Australia, like we're all over the map. This is, it, and we just take for granted the fact that we can all see each other and talk to each other yeah. and we're all the way around the world. Yeah, instantly. It yeah, just that's works. right. We, 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 we tend to, uh, we, yeah, we tend to spend some, some serious time zones sometimes, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, you know, it always works out and it's always, uh, it's always a lot of fun. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I'm sure you need no introduction, but to those folks who may not know who you are, uh, maybe they recognize your voice, maybe they don't. But uh, do you mind just uh, giving everyone at home just a, a quick introduction of uh, who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Richard Campbell. I've been in technology pretty much my entire life. My father is, was an electrical engineer. I burned my fingertips on a soldering iron at like six and uh, laid my hands on my first microcomputer at 10. So I've really never done anything else. I'm in my 50s now. And the career has gone in all the different corners that I could hope to, you know, the opportunities are vast. Of course, my hardware background is really strong uh, and I grew into the software space. So through the dot-com boom, I was mostly a scaling guy, helped mm -hmm. scale websites and deal with uh, building teams that were effective at large-scale websites and all of those kinds of problems. So I uh, landed in the startup culture for a while and uh, had some great adventures, no two ways about it. All, lots of stories that can be told. Uh, and then um, in the early aughts, I, I ran, I was uh, speaking at conferences by that point. I'd written a lot of magazine articles. Uh, I ran into Carl Franklin at a conference in Montreal and we became fast friends. He was already making a podcast before the word podcast existed. Yeah. So I was a guest on .NET Rocks episode 69 and he asked me to come on as co-host on show 100. And that was February of 2005. So we're, I think we put episode 1895 in the can today. Wow. Uh, I started Run As Radio back in April of 2007 because I thought there wasn't any good sysadmin podcasts that were sort of, mm. you know, favorable to Microsoft. So I've got 930 of those. And for a brief interval in the 20, 2011 to 2014, we made a show called The Tablet Show. We made 140 of those back when we weren't quite sure if .NET rocked or not. Yeah, and, uh, and I needed a place to put tablet and phone topics back when it was more confusing. So mm. all up, I think we're around a little over three thousand podcasts, in one form or oh another. Gosh. And uh, yeah, been traveling around, speaking at conferences, and telling people collect. You know, I'm a storyteller. That's what I love. Yeah. And mm. so you only get to tell stories if you know how to collect them. Mm. So learning from folks and then synthesizing that data and then telling it in a way that helps others. Wow, we were talking about you when we were preparing for the show, and we thought that you've had the benefit of meeting so many people. Mm -hmm. When we had Mary Jo on the show, she was describing to us about the the various CEOs that she's met, and talking about now of Microsoft, and that she met every Microsoft CEO and the the various different reactions that they had, the ones that banned her, which were you know, really, really great stories. Yeah, yeah. How she ran into the 
the right bill but the wrong Steve at a show and told uh, <laughs> Apple Steve to to please leave, leave them alone yeah. because you know <laughs> she's talking to Bill and Bill asked her, do you know who that was and she's like no <laughs> should I so we've had some incredible stories on so great. this show so Richard you've met a fair few of your own Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty uh, pretty much everybody at one time or another. I mean, I'm, I also live proximate to the Microsoft headquarters. So yeah. uh, it turns out if you're on campus all the time, you, you have more opportunities, at least pre-pandemic you did. Things mm -hmm. are still rearranging themselves. I have played mini golf with Steve Ballmer, um, which, by the way, he's a riot and knew, knew the company backward and forward, like mm -hmm. just a yeah. phenomenal conversation. But uh you know, most of the technology leaders are folks I've really related to. And I've, I got involved in the right time. You know, the dot, the emergence of .NET. And when I was really starting to go to Redmond regularly, it was the middle of the 90s. Mm. And so I just happened to be there for everything that became .NET. And so it was in those original SDRs for ASP Plus and was able to argue about how we were going to build software going forward and, and, uh, and get to know folks. And... Because I have that passion for the stories, end up spending a lot of time helping them tell their own stories. Yeah. So uh, I they hope don't, you put stuck. Uh, I've done all right. <laughs> we're we're going to be okay. I don't know if you know, you yeah, noticed, but I mean, it, it it wasn't doing very well for a long know, time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was the right time to buy it, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and I know, I know some folks that ended up uh, being in companies that were acquired by Microsoft and got mm -hmm. converted to Microsoft stock, and then sort of sat mm -hmm. with it, going, oh, I don't know what it's going to do, but they're pretty happy today. Pretty oh, happy yeah. right now. It's been a been yeah. a good four or five yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know anyone who's kind of been in that boat over the last four or five years who's ungrateful today, except for the those folks who kind of got rid of everything just before that that sort of switch happened. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You'll always be wondering, I guess, if you're if that was you. Yeah, well, there's a, there's lots of shoulda, woulda, coulda. You know, through the dot com boom, often they wanted to compensate you with stock as well, and most of that's just turned into toilet paper. Uh, mm. Once in a while, it became good things, but not that often. So, uh, where do you guys want to go? You know, there's a lot of stories to be told. Uh, certainly, you know, yeah. being through all the different podcasts and and the, I mean, you know, the history of .NET weighs heavily on me. I am trying to get the book written. This is right. hopefully the year we we get finished. It's just uh, been a, a challenge. Writing history is hard, even if you were there. But so, isn't it a book that keeps evolving? I mean, yeah, they, it's, like a, it's like a book that can actually never really be finished. Mm. I mean, that's true of most things, but yeah. uh, the current stuff is not the problem. In some ways, mm. .NET's never been in a better place than it is right now. Mm. It's trying to rationalize everything that happened in those early days. You know, mm. I mm. see .NET having gone through m several major transformations. The big one is to stop being something that sold Windows and become something that was cross-platform mm. and, and cloud, which many people still haven't really grappled with. But even before that, this transformation from sort of a desktop thing to a server thing mm. to kind of falling out of favor inside of Microsoft. In, in you know, there was a period there where the Microsoft was really serious about maybe we should just make JavaScript the thing, mm -hmm. and dot net was a, was kind of in a dark place. But then that changed. You know, the tides changed on that, and it went a different way again. And now, you know, we don't talk about it much, but. The, the smart client's in trouble. Mm. You know, it, it is, mm. if, you're an, if you're an enterprise architect and all things are being equal right now, I think it's very hard to pitch a deployable app to a client. Yeah. Because mm. the web does a pretty good job and the deployment mm. is painless and updates are not a big deal and we've got, clients are sufficient. Like, how do you justify mm. in a heterogeneous client world where you got to make it run on a phone and a tablet and a PC, the cost and effort to make a client for all of them? That's and true. then the I, I guess the 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 long tail of maintenance is the other part of that, right? Yeah. So you know I'm involved in a, a, a large project at the moment where um, the customer is modernizing an application that they've had for decades that mm -hmm. runs on prem and it's you know it's sort of a, a ERP CRM type system, um, and they're wanting to take this this the system into you know into Azure and, and modernize it, um, but it's it's hard work. Right, that that sort of legacy code base that you've had for so long, keeping that running and keeping that, uh, I guess, 
going with all of the modern advances um, can be difficult. Whereas if you're doing this thing, and it's an app, right? If you if you're deploying stuff, whereas mm -hmm. I guess if you if you have that web app sort of mindset, you're updating the application, right? And it, it's it's visible immediately to the to the the clients, and that's why we see, I guess, on the Exchange Online side, we're seeing you know. Outlook on the web being the primary client, right? All of right. the development goes there first before um, Outlook sort of catches up, and yeah. we won't yeah. get started by about the uh, the new Outlook that you know <laughs> shoulda, woulda, coulda. I guess I'm, I'm trying, Chris. I'm trying to like it. It's just I, it hates yeah. me more than I hate it. You know, yeah. yeah. At least now the old I, the old Outlook I grew respect. It's got 65 threads, and none of them are for me. But yeah. you know, <laughs> I knew what I was getting. That also sounds a lot like Google Chrome. You were talking. Mm. <laughs> now that's I have I have seventy percent of your memory, but none of it's for you. <laughs> I'd like to ask maybe a naive question when it comes to the adoption of .NET. Is PowerShell across platforms not a driver of .NET, particularly when you know, PowerShell came to the Mac and we were like. What? And was because .NET came to the Mac. Is mm. .NET coming to other OSs and the management frameworks that we have on those OSs not a large driver of .NET today? Well, if you're a large-scale .NET utilizer in the cloud, you already mm. run .NET and Linux because that's that's mm. literally 20 to 30% off your bill just mm. like that. And that's yeah. too big a number. If your CFO finds out you didn't do that, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, and it's trivial, actually, if you're fully over into, we're not allowed to call it core anymore, but modern versions of .NET, yeah. you are always running in Linux. You're just not running the client side well, at all. In a container. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did that really drive PowerShell? Not so much. I mean, PowerShell has a schism in it as well. You mm -hmm. know, the jump from 5.1 to 6 was a fundamentally breaking change. And a lot of folks stayed on, if you were didn't need to manage non-Windows machines, you stayed on 5.1. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's hard to justify today in, in PowerShell 7 because they're, they've gotten pretty much to feature parity. But it's one of those interesting truths where once you've dug in on 5.1 and you've skipped a couple of versions, you got a lot of inertia to not actually move. Uh, I've got a show coming up with Sydney Smith on, um, on Run As in a few weeks. Uh, we're talking about 7.4, and we're talking about the fact of you don't have any excuses anymore. Everything mm -hmm. you love in 5.1 runs in the current in the new version, mm -hmm. and you have the crossbot stuff, whether you use it or not, and a bunch of new things that don't run in five. Like it really is time to lift yourself up and go there. Um, but certainly, you know, .NET ran on other platforms well before this current wave. Anybody remember Silverlight? Because that oh, yeah. thing, that thing ran on a Mac. In 2010, yeah, but did it did it really? <laughs> well, it <laughs> it did, but then did, then but bad things did. happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, it's, really. it's an interesting point, right? And I think so. You're you're probably outnumbered because the three of us um, are are Mac users. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love my proudly, you know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but it, I mean, it's 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 a super useful tool for me now to not have to uh, run up a VM just to be able to do. Yeah. I mean, I still do for some things, right? Because sometimes mm -hmm. the modules don't always follow, you know, as closely as as, as yeah. the, the PowerShell itself. But uh, you know, it, it, it certainly has made my life a lot easier. And then, you know, VS Code and all these other great tools that I can run on my Mac uh, cool. is is perfect. But I, I wanted to ask a question about, so we're talking about .NET, we're talking about web applications, I guess, right? And, and you know, I'm not a, really a developer, so forgive me if I'm getting terminologies wrong, but... Mm -hmm. It seems to me that every other day there's a, a new framework out there that folks are jumping on. Like there's a new startup doing something with JavaScript or, or something else. And then it dies How, just as quickly. Well, not always, right? Because like look at things like React and Angular and those mm -hmm. things. Like are, are those competitive in any way to, to you know, the, the, the .NET sort of ecosystem? I mean, they, they've got a language, but you're, you're hitting on the key point, Chris, which is really yeah. it's a framework, right? right. It, and what are they doing differently than others are doing? Mm -hmm. uh, each of the web frameworks has a philosophy behind it. You know, one mm -hmm. is more the, the, you know, the React containerization or, or encapsulation of the feature set. Like they each take a, a different approach on it. But there are, they're just, you know, what are you comfortable doing web development on? 
it only gets really weird when you start playing into, are you getting out of the browser? Mm. Are you going to try, do you, do you have a, a native host for the phone, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, you're going to play the React Native game or, you know, go look at Flutter. If you're really, a, a not, you know, immersed in mobile development, Flutter had a lo has a lovely set of metaphors for building clients for iOS and Android, and they've been successful enough. Now they're trying to push down to Windows. I mean, one would argue this is the battle that Maui's having as well, because at its heart, Maui is Xamarin Forms and was pretty mm -hmm. good on iOS and Android, and is still wrestling to be great on Windows uh, and and dealing with all the stacks. The, the truth of the matter is, is that heterogeneous client development is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we had a very brief period, and maybe all of us are old enough to remember this, where largely the machine we were developing software on was the same machine that our customer was using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that was an anomaly, mm -hmm. right? As we now realize today, that mm -hmm. that will probably never happen again because the diversity of clients has gotten massive and we're not going to program on a phone that sounds mm. horrible. We're always going to be programming on a larger device, but then running on this diversity of devices. And we really want to write once and run anywhere. That's Although right. we're the only ones who want that. The customer couldn't care less. They just right. wanted to run on their device. And they'd prefer that it didn't suck while doing it. Right. So, well, yeah, you know, yeah. you've well, got to justify managing that. I mean, that being said... You know, I talk to PMs all the time who are managing na multiple native apps for a given app suite. So they've got a separate Android app, a separate web app, and a separate iOS app. And it's 50 to 100 grand a year to keep those mm -hmm. apps alive. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the cross-plat story is not just a convenience story. It's a cost mm -hmm. story. It is just not economically mm -hmm. viable. Plus, trying you've literally got three different development stacks running at the same time for the same app. Try and keep them feature sync. Because if you want to make a customer angry fast, let his friend with an I, the iOS version show you a feature that isn't on the Android version. Yet. That's a good oh, yeah. way to make people grumpy. Oh, yeah. Or when oh, they, yeah. or when they, or when they take it away. Yeah, <laughs> it was there and it was there it yesterday. Is, yeah, <laughs> something <laughs> and something <laughs> left. You know, <laughs> never make a progress bar go down. You're just going to yeah. make people mad. Yeah. <laughs> And then that, that leads to the next piece of the puzzle, which is obviously around an API, mm. right? And most of these things that we've talked about right now have a dependability on an API in mm -hmm. the background, and they have to, because there's no way that you can build all of these cross-platform uh, user interfaces without having some sort of API to integrate with. Mm -hmm. Everything's an API now. There's always that middle la middleware layer. So if you look at, Office 365, you look, so let's, let's take your PowerShell, mm -hmm. right? Those commandlets are interacting with an mm -hmm. API, right? So True. that's that, that entire commandlet is literally just converting PowerShell into a REST query. And that's what's happening in the background with a bunch of bits and bobs, you know, Terraform doing some deployments with ARM and things like that is going through the Azure, the Azure API. Mm -hmm, um, true. You know, retrieving those 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 emails or whatever the case, even the Azure portal, a whole bunch of stuff. That API layer is mm. pretty much the most important piece uh, of the puzzle in the background. We look at some of our internet banking apps and all of the stuff that happens between the between them and how they talk to each other. Those APIs are like fundamental, and you'll find that generally most of the time they're all built in .NET. Yeah, it's I mean, it's the easiest way to e easiest way to build an API when you think about it. Yeah, I mean, we're pretty language agnostic at this point. You know, we, here's the trick: if it wasn't built in .NET, would you know? I know yeah. you probably wouldn't know. You know, uh, you you look at what Microsoft's doing. There was a big outcry recently about C Sharp services being rewritten in Rust. Mm -hmm. Oh, Microsoft's yeah. abandoning C Sharp, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, the reality is is that Microsoft runs a large cloud infrastructure and they go around trying to make that cloud infrastructure services yeah. cost as little as possible. Yeah, as and efficient that, as possible. Yeah. Right. And those services had bubbled up as intense enough that they were worth rewriting. Hmm. And they were going to, and, and arguably they should have rewritten them in C++, but they don't hate themselves that much. And so writing <laughs> it in Rust, which gives a similar hmm. performance, but is a little safer, a little easier, also more popular with a younger generation of developers. So they might could get a different team to work on that as well. But what were they going after? Saving themselves money. 
They were going to provide the same services, com consuming less compute resources, and that is just money in their in their pockets for doing it. Yeah. So I think people think don't realize that in the background. Sorry, Chris. People don't realize that Office 365 and its various pieces of it are customers of Azure. Sure. Like yeah. people don't realize that in the background, right? Yeah, like, and, you, and they guarantee yeah, you, yeah. and they're being oh. billed for it. Yep. Right. Yes. I mean, you that, know. that department is being billed for those services that they're using. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, nothing's no, free right. in any of that. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was going to ask, like, we're on, I, I think, this the cusp as well of like this hardware evolution now as well, right? Mm. With MPUs and, you know, ARM starting to actually, you mm -hmm. know, make some inroads. Um, uh, yeah, the Elite X is pretty impressive. I was just listening to you to to you and, and Paul talking about that earlier uh, today and yesterday. Um, do you think that that's going to fundamentally change um, the way people kind of use .NET and, and, and work with it? Or do you think that those two things are kind of independent of each other and, and that the one's just good for the other? Well, look, the, the magic of .NET since day one has been mm -hmm. the hardware has been totally abstracted from you. That is what the common mm -hmm. runtime was all about. We've yeah. already had .NET running on ARM. That was WinRT. And mm -hmm. it was so easy, we forgot it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. right? It's just in, in Studio 2012, you now had a compile to WinRT option. Mm -hmm. we, we never noticed 64-bit for the most part because it just worked. Mm -hmm. And much less that there were two 64 pits, right? There was EM64T and there is AM64. They were actually different from each other. And for me as a .NET developer, didn't know, didn't care. We've always been abstracted from that problem space. So ARM's just going to happen in that respect. Uh, and ARM has been happening in the data center for the same mm -hmm. reason we've been describing. Mm -hmm. For a given U, U of shelf space in those data centers, as precious as they are, mm -hmm. they get more compute per inch with mm -hmm. ARM chipsets. Mm -hmm. What's astonishing to me is, you know, that that perhaps Snapdragon, the Elite X, is actually good enough to make a decent client that's going mm -hmm. that can actually emulate the x86 instruction set fast enough that we don't have to have all the app software converted to make this viable. We can emulate it good enough. It'll just not be as efficient as the converted stuff. So we can run both both sides. But I, I see them as two totally different things. The nice thing about cloud providers is they're fundamentally rational. They're saving money. And so they'll use whatever language or whatever architecture and whatever hardware saves them the money. The client side's always going to be a bit trickier, but We've been needing to get past the x86 instruction set for a long time. And we're getting down to the wire here. You know, five nanometer architectures, the chips are just not going to get that much denser. You're not getting the tick tock every 18 months win of a def additional computing resources for the same amount of money anymore. Mm. So there are better ways to improve efficiency and a simplified CPO architecture is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so, they, you know, there's no voodoo here. We're going to continue to optimize. It's just that we're getting off the addictive substance, the crack that is continuing to densify chips just because it's getting less and less cost effective. It's costing more and it's taking longer. And so now improving architectures, improving memory spaces, improving the way that all that stuff is laid out is going to get us to continue to get us those returns for some period of time. That being said, when's the last time you knew what the cycle speed of your computer was? Yeah. You know, that used to be a thing that they marketed against. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they don't do that anymore because it's meaningless. You mm -hmm. know, uh, if you ever get an opportunity to lay your hands on a Rolls Royce brochure, in the back of the brochure, it's very pretty and it's big and it's expensive. Mm. But in the back of it, when they get to the specs of the car, they under horsepower, it says sufficient. <laughs> 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 and Apple did this with the iPad and the and the last few generations yes. of Macs yeah. and so forth. <laughs> sufficient. That's right. Right. So we're off that treadmill. We're into this. This, and, we, and now you're starting to see this move towards replaceable batteries and so forth because the machine's fast enough and it'll last. There are parts that'll wear out and they should be replaceable. Yes. Uh, and, and that where we're going to see real improvements is going to be the shifts in architecture. You know, if I don't know if Elite X is it, I'm going to be on the hook for getting one. You know, I think it's pretty mm. sexy. 
-hmm. and uh, and we'll see if the battery life is great enough that you care and the software is sufficient that you're happy with it. Uh, and I'm walking past one of the things you said there, Chris, was the other shift in architecture, which Tim Cook, who's really a hardware guy over mm -hmm. at Apple, did with the M1, M2, and now M3 mm -hmm. chips, where we've bifurcated and even trifurcated the processing architectures mm -hmm. now, that you have a CPU, and you have a GPU, and you have an NPU. Not yeah. that there's a whole lot of difference between the yeah. GPU and the MPU, but that we're, again optimizing with silicon because we're at the limits of the general processor mm. do you predict richard that windows on arm is going to go from a stillborn child directly to a teenager well it has to because uh they won't use it otherwise right you know there's another and there's another angle on this and and I don't bring it up often on Windows Weekly just because Paul immediately goes into seizures, which is <laughs> all of the attempts that Microsoft has made to make a quote unquote safe version of Windows mm -hmm. because it's always been there and they've done it a number of times. But that is to say something that where processes have to stay in their own memory space that they run in isolation, that we get rid of those other problems. It's just that every single customer has one piece of software that mm -hmm. cannot run that way and each one of them has a different piece of software. And so invariably, you know, with the Windows 10 X was the, the safe version of Windows 10 that they I had a switch that said, turn this off. And inevitably, everybody turns it off. Yeah. So uh, the question now, you know, can we finally make a version of Windows that can that you don't have to turn that off that you there's another way to manage that badly behaved app that it runs in some kind of container local to your machine. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. There are very smart people working on that problem because it's necessary. But we are finding a way to scrape off the cruft of yes. 40 years of PC architectures to try and modernize because otherwise you die. You'll be replaced. Yeah. You know, you guys have already done the logical thing. You've ditched the dinosaur to run the superior hardware. There's no denying that the M3 Mac Air is the finest PC made today. Agreed. Mm -hmm. you, you can't, and, and that's finally put the scare into enough people to, to get serious about the, you know, Snapdragons and all this sort of thing to try and make an alternative to that because mm -hmm. Apple has been quite cavalier about simply killing the elderly. To <laughs> the, the, the old, you know what happens to the old software? It stops running and you will that's live right. with it. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. So, it stops. That's Where, that's a good point. They, they don't backtrack on announcements, right? Nope. The, no, no. Deprecation announcements mm -hmm. and stuff. In fact, they probably doesn't even they probably don't even accept comment on that. They're just like, this is what's happening. It's but happening at this time. But at the same time, look at their penetration in enterprise because that is not how enterprise yeah. works, right? Yeah, that's right. The right. the United States Navy still runs XP on the majority of their ships, and Microsoft supports it because that's a big enough contract. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the way I it was described to me many, many years ago is that Bill Gates figures out which way the, the parade is going and runs in front. So it looks like he's leading the parade. We, wow. we I, I, you know, so we, before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about uh, community. And we one of the things we talked about was the, the Microsoft Certified Master Program mm -hmm. in community, which Nick and I, oh. um, you know, it was, a great, it was uh, a great thing when it existed. It, it was, and we, we, you know, we we dedicated a lot of caffeine and late nights to to that program. Um, and a big chunk but, of our lives. Yes, mm -hmm. um, but one of the fantastic speaking of dinosaurs. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> speaking of dinosaurs, <laughs> what, one Good of the fantastic exchange. sort Sorry. of stories that came out of that um, program for me was I when I did my rotation, um, and I, I want to be careful here to to try and. Uh, uh, censor this as much as I can. When I did my rotation, one of the fellows that was on the rotation with me, he did some work with, uh, you know, US defense in um, on the exchange side, right? Uh, now, this also was, you know, 12 years ago or something like that. Um, and he, he, he mentions a, a particular incident where he, there was a problem uh, and they were in you know, some superior uh, officers, uh, you know, um, office talking about, you know, why can't the product do this thing? And he was like, well, this is not how the product works. We don't do it this way. And he said, hold on for me one second. And he pulled out his phone and he made a call. <laughs> and that call was to someone, you know, Gates-esque, right? Yeah, uh, which, which, there, which, up you know, there. <laughs> yeah, yes. Needless to say, 
very you know very soon after that they started working on uh, fixing that problem right so yeah. it's a good it's a good point in that you know when you have customers that large um mm. and and you know that with that much investment you know you 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 work with your customer right you got sure well and it, to it. you're like your current generation example of that is Less than a year ago, Microsoft was telling us that Win 10 would go out of mainstream support in April of 2025. So get moving. That's right. It's, it's now October 2025, mm -hmm. right? So they've already slipped that six months. I strongly mm -hmm. suspect they'll slip it again because there, there's an awful lot of customers who are pretty happy in 10 and haven't seen anything in 11 that they care about. And 11 yeah. is only just, you know, coming up from this from an enterprise perspective, 11 has only now gotten to parity with 10 in terms mm -hmm. of group policy rules and, and, the, and the like. So that you could just migrate. It's not a major breaking change. Not that we shouldn't shake off an awful lot of group policy cruft, because mm -hmm. we should. Yes. Um, but for no other reason than you, I can point to virtually any group policy, you've got to sign in there and say, where did this come from? And you do not know. No. Yes. <laughs> oh, the amount of times I look at, and I've actually been doing a lot of, AD remediation and security yes. work lately. And the amount of times I look at AD group policies and there are hundreds of objects there that yep. are not even linked to anything, right? No. And you're like, well, what do these do? Well, we don't know. I'm like, I can you tell you know, what they do. But... Absolutely nothing because they're not linked to anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and we never built the documentation tree that mm. we demand of stuff today. You know, yes. this stuff should have all been injected into GitHub the whole time. And, yes. re and reversible and have a and have a path through that we saw how each things were created and who created them like mm. the devs got that right and oh, and yes. more and more admins i know are using this and coming to realize that that institutional knowledge that that source control represents is worth more than the end result anyway 100 percent, because you can't always rely on that you know johnny or Jane, who who did that work, is still going to be there in six Almost years. Almost certainly time, is. Time, you know, yeah. and that's. I think that's a big change. That and even if they with. are, they do yeah. not remember. Like, <laughs> that's right. that's how right. could they? Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting, I think, about the Windows 11 story in the enterprise, right? Is is that we saw a shift at some point with hardware because mm -hmm. customers were hanging on to Windows 7 for so yes. long. Right? Well, it was a good version and, of Windows. Right, it was good, uh, and, yeah. it was, and it was bracketed by a pair of fairly bad versions of Windows. Exactly, <laughs> um, and and so what what we sort of saw in the sort of um, modern work side of things was that we'd go into a customer and we would we would start talking about okay, you you want to migrate to you know Exchange Online? Let's uh, let's have a look at you know getting that mm -hmm. sorted out for you. Like we'll, we'll we'll do the foundational things and we'll look at the Exchange migration, and then sort of about midway through that big wave of everyone going to Exchange Online. That process had to take a pause because all of a sudden you'd go into a customer, you go, you want to go to Exchange Online? Uh-oh. Well, we need to look at your, your desktops first because right. you're running unsupported stuff now. Yeah. So we need well, a new, you and need goodness a new knows what, what your functional level is. Like right. you, you are definitely walking into a series of wasp nests when you right. start saying, Oh, we're just gonna migrate this. Oh, sure yes. you are. And then it's like, okay, well, we're gonna look at your old version of Office. Uh, and in, inevitably, there's some macro in my some department that doesn't work on new versions. But yep. then you start looking at Windows, right? And so a lot of organizations went through that very last minute, we're going to get new machines for everyone to go to Windows 10 thing. Yep. Not too long ago. Yep. Now Windows 11, as you said, comes out and it doesn't have all that much of appeal, you know, in terms of like f new no. features and functionality. And it has like hardware uh, specs that are that are now different to the new hardware mm -hmm. that organizations. Have well, just mainly in. TPM two, but right. yeah, you know, it's pretty moot now. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's that sort of hold on as well of like the we've got this hardware issue that we don't necessarily want to solve right now. Um, but it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I don't know very many customers that I work with that have gone all in on Windows eleven just no, yet. Not many not at the enterprise them, level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, be and because for no other reason, if you just went through a group policy implement against Win 11, it, it went nuts. It was bad. Yeah. Now, I mean, the, la the last couple of iterations, uh, by 23H2, you're pretty good shape. Like, hmm. you're down to the point where if it's a policy that's complaining, it's probably a bad policy. Like, it's yeah. on the other, other foot now. It's like, hmm. what is that policy? Why is it there? You know, and it's an orphan of something that you never reverted out. You should probably get rid of it. Hmm. Um, but again, there's not a lot of incentive to that. This is an artificial constraint being created by Microsoft, mm. right? I like and, that artificial. Yep. Yeah. And I think, I mean, if you go under the hood and take a good long look, you know, Windows 11 is actually 10.1, right? Like <laughs> rounded edges. 
Yeah, that's it. They they got upset when Mac when when Apple made a new version of Mac OS and decided they had to do something. Heck, they even centered the taskbar. They were so envious, hmm. and then we all wanted to put it back. Uh, Richard, I wanted to ask: Did the entire industry misunderstand that Windows Ten was supposed to be the last? version of Windows. Well, Microsoft told us very clearly that was true and then made different versions every quarter just to make it confusing. Hmm. Right? They just didn't change the major version number. That's all. And in fact, they still haven't changed the major version number because when you change major version numbers, things break. And there was some obscure statement that I found that said, no, that's not what we said in the first place. Yeah, okay. So you're going to revise history. You can feel free. But, you know, we got the original quote. That's what you said. That yeah. guy doesn't work there anymore, but you know, eh, not your problem. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think definitely, definitely interesting that whole sort of where to go with that, right? It was um, also you I... understand it was a mistake. It was an experiment, and it turned out to be a mistake. Hmm. Microsoft had a problem with Windows, which was that it, they had a group of people that had been working on Windows for decades, and they had a and they had more than enough money. Like, I don't know how you incentivize several thousand engineers who've done 20 plus years at Microsoft have more than enough money. If you push them too hard, they're just going to quit. Yeah. Right. And, and they, and they carry around a bunch of information that's vital. And so, you know, how do you get them to make things better? And so they put a lot of pressure on them. Like we talk about 10 being the last version of windows, but the reality was they were trying to push out builds every quarter, which for an administrator was hell. Mm -hmm. Then they did crazy things like WinUI was part of that. So now you've got developers building UWP apps that depend on a particular version of WinUI, which means, hey, I can't roll out this app until you update Windows, which mm -hmm. to the average discipline is just a giggle. It's like, mm -hmm. get in line, kid. That'll be a year from now. Mm -hmm. like, that's, not, that's not happening. Uh, but he, eventually, the Windows team was in pain trying to go that quickly, and the customers are in pain trying to go that quickly. And Enterprise they, customers struggle with that. They backed away, right? But yeah. don't believe anything. This is there's no nefarious intent. I'm going to quote Scott Hansen when he said, "We are not organized enough to be as evil as you think we are." Right? Like <laughs> they were trying things. They were trying to yeah. shake up their org. They were trying to be work a different way. They watched how the .NET team was iterating super rapidly and was doing stuff in public and and checking stuff into GitHub and their entire roadmap is sitting there and. Some features slip and some feet stay in, but it's all visible. You know, could you do that with Windows? You know, they tried very hard. The problem here is that people don't care. Mm. You know what you want from an operating system? Reliability. That's not where you look for new features. Mm, that's it's right. plumbing. Do you yeah. look for innovation in microcode in your CPU? Do you look for it in your BIOS or your UFI? No. You expect it to work every day. Mm -hmm. And that's really where operating systems are get, have gotten to, except yeah. that there are certain people whose promotions are dependent on that not being true. And mm -hmm. so they keep trying to push things through that pipeline, whether we want them to or not. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, Those uh, w widgets that jump up all over the place when you're oh, just trying to... You know, oh, yeah, no. You, look, the Windows with the six-year-old embedded in it. Click me, click me, click me. Right? Like, <laughs> who? Yeah. Nobody wants that. No. Now, I would also say that the AI wave has derailed that because yeah. arguably the most logical hosts for a large language model that changes your relationship to work, where I now describe my work intent Windows. to a language model, it should be Windows. Windows yeah. should be the hub of that, except that that's not happening because that's not where the Windows team is politically, much less technically. You know, I would oh, argue wow. the, the current winning hub for that is M365 because mm. that is a powerhouse team. They are organized. It is already a locus of work, mm. and they have a problem that the LLM addresses very usefully, which is the graph. Mm. You know, you we've been all around long enough. We've watched M365 emerge from BPods and all those other things, and we know we know that there's a set of data there. That are incredible. That is the organization's data, which is the interactions of the people with each other through email, through collaboration tools, through documents, and so forth. That graph, that web of interaction, has been there mm. for years and years and years. And it's it's the company's property. It's just that nobody knows how to navigate it. And Microsoft has tried several times to mm. surface that to us. Except mm. that every time you do that, it falls into the uncanny valley. It's super creepy. 
to be told what the graph knows. Mm. Yes. But the uh, LLM, you know, yeah. the M365 Copilot, changed that on its head. Because now you're telling the software what your intent is. And if it happened to lean on the graph to answer your intent, maybe that's acceptable. It doesn't mm. feel like corporate surveillance. It feels like help. <laughs> right? I you've, was gotten say the, this. you've gotten the Viva email where it said, hey, you know, you wrote this email where you told this person you'd do this thing. <laughs> Have you ever done it? it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, right. <laughs> that's corporate surveillance, but helpful corporate surveillance. Yes, the, right? you know the the, the um, but there was a while where I was I was using Delve as my search engine for mm. SharePoint Online because I never said the I name, could... but you knew. Yeah, <laughs> I was the only the only way I could actually find stuff in SharePoint Online was through Delve. But, yeah, you know, Europe. I had Europe, a lot of European customers were really flipping out about the the Viva stuff, right? Because yeah. or, you know, obviously, they're a lot stricter on things like uh, employee surveillance and and mm -hmm. that type of thing. So for a lot of them, it was like we got to turn the stuff off right away. But Thanks you understand that. this product was built to deal with that. Right. You know, back in my sysadmin days, it was very normal for us to roll out an app, and then I would watch the logs to see which of the employees were using it. Hmm. And you know, and sooner or later, there'd be a glaring hole. It's like, well, this person who this app was clearly intended for is not using it at all. I don't see any interest in the log. And so, because I'm fairly diplomatic, I could go to that person and say, "Hey, how's it going?" And chat and so forth. I, you know, hmm. I notice you, and maybe I get them on the training program that's necessary. Hmm. Now, if you don't do that with some grace, that's a pretty quick HR violation, hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. But and and what Viva does is try to do that in a non-discriminatory way where you're actually building a set of policies mm -hmm. that are not specific to any individual that will trigger on their own without any direct human intervention to say uh -huh. training is needed here. That's a that's HR cover. Computer says no. Yeah. Com yeah, computer says you could be doing this better. Right? Uh -huh. And it, and and it's not based on specific individuals, it's based on behavior. And there was a time when there were a lot of license management products for O365 that that did that too, right? C sure. Customers were, were buying a ton of licenses and they really didn't have a lot of metrics about who was actually using mm. that stuff, right. right? So so then, you know, you could deploy the product, you would go and have a look and then it would say, well, you know, Johnny's got uh, a Teams license and this was probably around the time Teams became a thing. Johnny's mm -hmm. got a Teams license but doesn't ever log into Teams. So, you know, do you need a license or do you yeah. need training? Like mind. pick an option, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and and Fair so enough. you know, and and I think it's important. One of the things that makes Viva weird is that it's an emergent product, mm -hmm. right? Nobody sat down and said we're going to need to make these set of things. This is actually stuff that Microsoft built, started building internally for themselves because they had this problem, mm -hmm. and then they productized it. Mm -hmm. Which wow. is why it, it that's why it feels odd because that's the way most of them work. Well, Believe it or <laughs> the good ones, yeah, right. That's how front door was made. <laughs> yeah, but it's the thing is, software built from a need beats the heck out of software built from the vision of an individual. Yeah. That that's you right. Know, you know, it, so it, you know, there's a strong, there's a real strength to approaching it from that way, but it's tricky to productize it too because you don't want to make yourself the case study in the process. Mm -hmm. So you you kind of have to play with have we generalized this enough? It's like yeah, imagine you're the highest market cap company in the world and you need yeah. an HR management tool. <laughs> yeah. Eva. Because yeah, yeah, the reality is that a lot of all needs are slightly different, right? So yeah, yeah without I mean, a I doubt, you you yeah. would presume. Yeah. So but, yeah, enough. we we are in an interesting point right now because Microsoft has chosen to lead on this. And that has not been the Microsoft way for 20 years. You know, mm -hmm. the byproduct of the whole DOG cri DOJ crisis back in 2000 that led to Bomber being CEO and Bill stepping down and so forth resulted in a consent decree that in a lot of ways just made it, it, it wise for Microsoft mm -hmm. to come in second all the time. Mm. And that became a cultural norm. We don't have to be the best. We just have to be there in all the different places and bundling will carry us. Yes. Right? You could probably pick a better collaboration tool, but Teams is good enough. You can pick a, you know, and just go down the list, right? That's mm -hmm. the, the nature of Microsoft. But now we have a new CEO. And, uh, and he's been a bit of a caretaker, sort of cleaning up things and so forth, but looking for something that he could say, that was mine. Yeah. That and wasn't was, something I picked it, up from right? the other guy. Yeah. And for whatever, you know, 
Kevin Scott, bless him, amazing man. I've had a number of great conversations with him over the years. He made that deal with OpenAI when it was on the skids, when it was out of money and in big trouble to move over to Azure. Nobody knew if it was going to become something or not. Mm. But when it became something, Microsoft moved. Yeah. And it, and and uh, when Satya put out his notice internally, January of 2023, I think it was the first time he had done a Bill Gates-like all hands, you know, Bill did the internet tidal wave in 97 and he did trustworthy computing in 2001 mm -hmm. that were basically a, a directive to the whole company. Stop what mm -hmm. you're doing and do this. Yes. And in January of 23, Satya Nadella did that to Microsoft. He said, whatever you're working, whatever you're doing right now, stop, take a look at these APIs that we have access to now through the large language model and see what you can do with it. And I've heard rumor that internally there's over 200 copilots as a byproduct of that. With any luck, most of them don't become public. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also, you think think of the minds that extraordinary mm. company that all of these remarkable developers who all have domain knowledge in these various products mm. all put that API to work. And some of them are going to come up with some real original things. A lot of it's going to be derivative and can be consolidated. And that's what you're seeing happen under the hood right now is the inside of Microsoft. They're trying to rationalize all of the efforts that happened in 23. Mm -hmm. But they've and also made it available for you to use as well. Some of them. And, it, and I'm glad because if they dropped 200 on us, we'd, we'd be in hell. Yeah. 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 If you yeah. think about the way things are moving now with model as a service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've gone, we've purchased all the infrastructure, as many GPUs as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Now you can run any large language model that you want inside yep. of Azure, out of the marketplace. And then on top of that, and this is actually something that I did want to ask, and I think it's a cool way of us sort of landing this conversation with you, is I really wanted to ask you about semantic kernel. Mm -hmm. You know, being with .NET for so long and seeing... Mark Rosinovich and uh, the Scott Hanselmans throughout the years and all these lovely things that we've been doing. Semantic kernel and the way you can integrate a large language model into pretty much any MVC application. Now. Right. You can just like, I mean, if I can do it and I'm not, a, I'm not like, a, you know, <laughs> I grew up scripting. <laughs> I'm PowerShell and Bash and those and PHP and those sorts of things. But I mean, if I can go and take C Sharp and integrate an LLM into some C Sharp code like this, yep. I mean, that's pretty sweet. So yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, this is where Microsoft is right company at right time because they are deep down a developer tools company. That's oh. where they started. You know, first product was a version of basic, right? right? And they've, that's always, they've always had that route. If there's anything they're good at, it's knowing how to service a set of tool for their developers to go and experiment with. And the semantic kernel seems to be a nexus on bringing this new set of tools into play. But you know, you're generally bumping against what comes next, which is the agent model, right? That we go beyond writing a prompt and getting a response and into yeah. events are occurring in my space that I want you to organize and perhaps prepare responses for me. So I'm not the one saying what's happening. You're mm -hmm. the one telling me what's happening and recommended actions on those. Mm -hmm. And now we get it, you know, over on the data science side, we called this predictive analytics, right? Mm -hmm. Or even our prescriptive analytics, where it's, this is the best way to keep this this pre-customer engaged mm -hmm. right? to, you know, raise up interest level in a product, that kind of thing. So you, you can imagine this in interactions with any kind of software. Uh, mm -hmm. And you, so the, you know, semantic kernel is the first attempt to make that invisible. And I think Microsoft's doing the same thing that Satya did in 23 to the company. Let's put this in front of people and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Like there's almost what are they going to cook? Almost, with a, it? almost a deliberate lack of guidance. Go forth and experiment. Mm -hmm. wow. Richard, we, we sadly coming to the top of the hour, and I wish I could have another episode with you just even to talk about graph and the <laughs> no, things that to. we were hoping there will be for. a part two. <laughs> <laughs> But before we let you go, mm -hmm. what is it that you would like to plug, either personally or corporately? Do you want to be found on socials? 
Uh, I mean, I'm pretty findable. I feel pretty <laughs> found, actually. Uh, obviously, I make a bunch of podcasts. These days, it's each week is a .NET Rocks, a run as radio, and a Windows Weekly. Uh, yeah. I do make conferences. This doesn't come up quite as often, but I own the Dev Intersection series of conferences. So our next show is coming up the week of September 8th. And uh, oddly enough, strong co-pilot focus on that. There. Mm -hmm. But um, also, uh, you know, I've been pitching Damian Edwards and and uh, David Fowler to come and do an Aspire workshop because I think uh, what's happening in, in dot, be, .NET becoming more cloud native mm -hmm. uh, is important also. And I, I want to mm -hmm. make that more available to more folks. So we're pushing in that direction. And in general, our language continues to improve. Our tools continue to improve. Those are always good conversations uh, to have. But how we're going to rectify this new set of tools and, you know, and again, Microsoft's moving quicker than most of us. We're not used to them being this fast mm -hmm. um, where we're going to see it run more on devices and less dependent on cloud. Like all of those things are being exposed at the same time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's certainly been uh, a, an exciting period, but other than that, like you'll, you'll see me muttering about one thing or another. I, I have the luxury of going to a lot of conferences in a year. So yeah. you'll, you'll usually see me around there. Some of who pick up some shows. Sometimes I get to tell some stories. You know, there, mm. there, there are many different choices. So well, I'm happy time, to chat. Next time we bump into each other somewhere, mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll definitely make sure we bring a, a Cloud Architects brown liquor well, of the week for well, you. You're, to, uh, you're down in Sydney, Chris. we got to go to the Baxter. Like, that's the place to go. And I, I generally end right. up in the cage in short order because <laughs> I start asking about whiskeys. They're like, I think that's in the cage. And we go yeah. to the cage well, and <laughs> usually come up with something unusual. Well, Sounds yes, amazing. we'll definitely try and figure something think, figure something out uh, for the next mm -hmm. time we see you. But uh, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate uh, you. Uh, great to chat with you guys, for sure. Sharing your knowledge thank with you. us.